Chapter 2. Simon. I don't let myself think about Watford over the summers. After my first year there, when I was eleven, I spent the whole summer thinking about it. Thinking about everyone I'd met at school, Penelope, Agatha, the mage, about the towers and the grounds, the teas, the puddings, the magic. The fact that I was magic. I made myself sick thinking about the Watford School of Magics, daydreaming about it until it started to feel like nothing more than a daydream. Just another fantasy to make the time pass. Like when I used to dream about becoming a footballer someday. Or that my parents, my real parents, were going to come back for me. My dad would be a footballer, and my mum would be some posh model type, and they'd explain how they'd had to give me up because they were too young for a baby, and because his career was on the line. But we always missed you, Simon, they'd say. We've been looking for you. And then they'd take me away to live in their mansion. Footballer mansion, magical boarding school, they both seem like crap in the light of day, especially when you wake up in a room with seven other discards. That first summer, I'd beaten the memory of Watford to a bloody pulp by the time my bus fare and papers showed up in the autumn, along with a note from the mage himself. Real! It was all real. So the next summer, after my second year at Watford, I didn't let myself think about magic at all. For months, I just shut myself off from it. I didn't miss it. I didn't wish for it. I decided to let the world of mages come back to me like a big surprise present come September, if it was going to. And it did come back. It always has so far. The mage used to say that maybe someday he'd let me spend summers at Watford. Or maybe spend them with him, wherever he goes all summer. But then he decided I was better off spending part of every year with the normals, to stay close to the language and to keep my wits about me. Let hardship sharpen your blade, Simon. I thought he meant my actual blade, the Sword of Mages. Eventually I figured out he meant me. I'm the blade, the mage's sword, and I'm not sure if these summers in children's homes make me any sharper, but they do make me hungrier. Oh, they make me crave Watford like, I don't know. Like life itself? Baz and his side, all the old rich families, they don't believe that anyone can understand magic the way that they do. They think that they're the only ones who can be trusted with it. But no one loves magic like I do. None of the other magicians, none of my classmates, none of their parents know what it's like to live without magic. Only I know. And I will do anything to make sure it's always here for me to come home to. I try not to think about Watford when I'm away, but it was almost impossible this summer. After everything that happened last year, I couldn't believe the mage would even pay attention to something like the end of term. Who interrupts a war to send kids home for summer holiday? Besides, I'm not a kid anymore. Legally, I could have left care at 16. I could have got my own flat somewhere, maybe in London. I could afford it. I have an entire bag of leprechaun's gold. A big duffel-sized bag, and it only disappears if you try to give it to the other magicians. But the maid sent me off to a new children's home, just like he always does. Still moving me around like a pea under shells after all these years. Like I'd be safe there. Like the humdrum couldn't just summon me, or whatever it was he did to me in Pen Penny at the end of last term. He can summon you, Penny demanded as soon as we got away from him. Across a body of water? That isn't possible, Simon. There's no precedent for that. Next time he summons me like a half arse squirrel demon, I said, I'll tell him so. Penelope had been unlucky enough to be holding my hand when I was snatched, so she'd been snatched right along with me. Her quick thinking is the only reason either of us escaped. Simon, she said that day when we were finally on a train back to Watford, this is serious. Siegfried and fucking Roy Penny. I know that it's serious. He's got my number. I don't even have my number, but the humdrum's got it down. How can we still know so little about him? She fumed. He's so insidious, I said. The insidious humdrum and all that. Stop teasing, Simon. This is serious. I know, Penny. When we got back to Watford, the mage heard us out and made sure we weren't hurt. And then he sent us on our way, just sent us home. It didn't make any sense. So of course I spent this whole summer thinking about Watford. 
about everything that happened and everything that could happen and everything that's at stake, I stewed on it. But I still didn't let myself dwell on any of the good things. You know, it's the good things that'll drive you mad with missing them. I keep a list of all the things I miss most, and I'm not allowed to touch it in my head until I'm about an hour from Watford. Then I run through the list one by one. It's sort of like easing yourself into cold water. But the opposite of that, I suppose. Easing yourself into something really good, so the shock of it doesn't overwhelm you. I started making my list, my good things list, when I was eleven, and I should probably cross a few things off, but that's harder than you'd think. Anyway, I'm about an hour from school now, so I mentally take out my list and press my forehead against the train window. Things I miss most about Watford. Number one, sour cherry scones. I had never had a cherry scones before Watford. Just raisin ones, and more often plain, and always something that come from the shop, and then got left in an oven too long. At Watford, there were fresh baked cherry scones for breakfast every day if you want them. And again in the afternoon with tea. We have tea in the dining hall after our lessons, before clubs and football and homework. I always have tea with Penelope and Agatha, and I'm the only one of us who ever eats the scones. Dinner is in two hours, Simon. Agatha will tisk at me, even after all these years. Once Penelope tried to calculate how many scones I've eaten since we started at Watford, but she got bored before she got to the answer. I just can't pass up the scones if they're there. They're soft and light and a little bit salty. Sometimes I dream about them. Number two, Penelope. This spot on the list used to belong to roast beef, but a few years back I decided to limit myself to one food item. Otherwise the list just turns into the food song from Oliver, and I get so hungry my stomach cramps. I should maybe rank Agatha higher than Penelope. Agatha is my girlfriend, but Penelope made the list first. She befriended me in my first week of school during our magic words lesson. I didn't know what to make of her when we met. A chubby little girl with light brown skin and bright red hair. She was wearing pointy spectacles, the kind you'd wear if you were going as a witch to a fancy dress party. And there was a giant purple ring weighing down her right hand. She was trying to help me with an assignment. And I think I was just staring at her. I know you're Simon Snow, she said. My mum told me you'd be here. She says you're really powerful, probably more powerful than me. I'm Penelope Bunce. I didn't know someone like you could be named Penelope, I said stupidly. Everything I said that year was stupid. She wrinkled her nose. What should someone like me be named? I don't know. I didn't know. Other girls I'd met who looked like her were named Sanvi or Aditi. And they definitely weren't Ginger. Sanvi? Someone like me can be named anything, Penelope said. Oh, I said. Right. <laughs> Sorry. And we can do whatever we want with our hair. She turned back to the assignment, flipping her red ponytail. It's impolite to stare, you know, even at your friends. Are we friends? I asked her, more surprised than anything else. I'm helping you with your lesson, aren't I? She was. She just helped me shrink a football to the size of a marble. I thought you were helping me because I'm thick, I said. Everyone's thick, she replied. I'm helping you because I like you. It turned out she'd accidentally turned her hair that color, trying out a new spell. But she wore it red all of first year. The next year she tried blue. Penelope's mum is Indian, and her dad is English. Actually, they're both English. The Indian side of her family has been in London for ages. She told me later that her parents had told her to steer clear of me at school. My mum said that nobody really knew where you came from, and that you might be dangerous. Why didn't you listen to her? I asked. Because nobody knew where you came from, Simon, and you might be dangerous. You have the worst survival instincts. Also, I felt sorry for you, she said. You were holding your wand backwards. I miss Penny every summer, even when I tell myself not to. The maid says no one can write to me or call me over the holidays, but Penny still finds a way to send messages. 
Once she possessed the old man down at the shop, the one who forgets to put in his teeth. She talked right through him. It was nice to hear from her and everything, but it was so disturbing that I had to not to do it again unless there was an emergency. Number three, the football pitch. I don't get to play football as much as I used to. I'm not good enough to play on the school team, plus I'm always caught up in some scheme or drama or out on a mission for the mage. You can't reliably tend a goal when the bloody humdrum can summon you any time it strikes his fancy. But I do get to play, and it's a perfect pitch. Lovely grass, the only flat part of the ground. Nice, shady trees nearby that you can sit under and watch the matches. Baz plays for our school, of course, the tosser. He's the same on the field as he is everywhere else. Strong, graceful, fucking ruthless. Number four, my school uniform. I put this on the list when I was 11. You have to understand, when I got my first uniform, it was the first time I'd ever had clothes that fit me properly. The first time I'd ever worn a blazer and tie. I felt tall all of a sudden, and posh, until Baz walked into our room, much taller than me, and posher than everyone. There are eight years at Watford. First and second years wear striped blazers, two shades of purple and two shades of green, with dark grey trousers, green jumpers, and red ties. You have to wear a boater on the grounds up until your sixth year, which is really just a test to see if your stay put is strong enough to keep a hat on. Penny always spelled mine on for me. If I did it myself, I'd end up sleeping in the damn thing. There's a brand new uniform waiting for me every autumn when I get to our room. It'll be laid out on my bed, clean and pressed and perfectly fitted, no matter how I've changed or grown. The upper years, that's me now, wear green blazers with white piping, plus red jumpers if we want them. Capes are optional too, I've never worn one, they make me feel like a tit, but Penny likes them, says she feels like Stevie Nicks. I like the uniform, I like knowing what I'm going to wear every day. I don't know what I'll wear next year when I'm done with Watford. I thought I might join the Major's men, they've got their own uniform, sort of Robin Hood meets MI6, but Mage says that's not my path. That's how he talks to me. It's not your path, Simon. Your destiny lies elsewhere. He wants me to stand apart from everyone else. Separate training, special lessons. I don't think he'd even let me go to school at Watford if he weren't the headmaster there, and if he didn't think it was the safest place for me. If I asked the mage what I should wear after Watford, he'd probably kick me out like a superhero. I'm not asking anybody what I should wear when I leave. I'm 18. I'll dress myself. Or Penny will help. Number five. My room. I should say our room, but I don't miss sharing with Baz part of it. You get your room and your roommate assignment at Watford as a first year, and then you never move. You never have to pack up your things or take down your posters. Sharing a room with someone who wants to kill me, who's wanted to kill me since we were eleven, has been... Well, it's been rubbish, hasn't it? But maybe the Crucible felt bad about casting Baz and me together. Not literally. I don't think the Crucible's sentient. Because we've got the best room at Watford. We live in Mama's house. On the edge of the school grounds, it's a four-and-a-half-story building, stone, and our room is at the very top in a sort of turret that looks out over the moat. The turret's too small for more than one room, but it's bigger than the other student rooms, and it used to be staff accommodation, so we have our own ensuite. Baz is actually a fairly decent person to share a bathroom with. He's in there all morning, but he's clean, and he doesn't like me to touch his stuff, so he keeps it all out of the way. Penelope says our bathroom smells like cedar and bergamot, and that's got to be Baz, because it definitely isn't me. I tell you how Penny manages to get into our room, Girls are banned from the boys' houses and vice versa, but I still don't know. I think it might be her ring. I saw her use it once to unseal a cave, so anything's possible. Number six. The mage. I put the mage on the list when I was eleven, too, and there have been plenty of times when I thought I should take him off. Like in our sixth year, when he practically ignored me. Every time I tried to talk to him, he told me he was in the middle of something important. He still tells me that sometimes. I get it. 
He's the headmaster, and he's more than that, he's the head of the coven, so technically he's in charge of the whole world of mages, and it's not like he's my dad. He's not my anything. But he's the closest thing I've got to anything. The mage is the one who first came to me in the normal world and explained to me, or, or tried to explain to me, who I am. He still looks out for me, sometimes when I don't even realise it. And when he does have time for me to really talk to me, that's when I feel the most grounded. I fight better when he's around. I think better. It's like when he's there, I almost buy into what he's always told me. That I'm the most powerful magician the world of mages has ever known. And all that power is a good thing. Or at least that it will be some day. That I'll get my shit together eventually and solve more problems than I can cause. The mage is also the only one who's allowed to contact me over the summer. And he always remembers my birthday in June. Number seven. Magic. Not my magic, necessarily. That's always with me, and honestly, not something I can take much comfort in. What I miss when I'm away from Watford is just being around magic. Casual, ambient magic. People casting spells in the hallways and during lessons. Somebody sending a plate of sausages down the dinner table like it's bouncing on wires. The world of mages isn't actually a world. We don't have cities or even neighborhoods. Magicians have always lived among mundanity. It's safer that way, according to Penelope's mum. It keeps us from drifting too far from the rest of the world. The fairies did that, she said, got tired of dealing with everyone else, wandered into the woods for a few centuries, then couldn't find their way back. The only place magicians live together, unless they're related, is at Watford. There are a few magical social clubs and parties, annual gatherings, that sort of thing, but Watford is the only place where we're together all the time. Which is why everyone's been pairing off like crazy in the last couple years. If you don't meet your spouse at Watford, Penny says, you could end up alone, or going on singles tours of Magical Britain when you're 32. I don't know what Penny's even worried about. She's had a boyfriend in America since our fourth year. He was an exchange student at Watford. Micah plays baseball, and he has a face so symmetrical you could summon a demon on it. They video chat when he and she's home, and when she's at school, he writes to her almost every day. Yes, she tells me, but he's American. They don't think about marriage the way we do. He might dump me for some pretty normal he meets at Yale. Mum says that's where our magic is going, bleeding out through ill-considered American marriages. Penny quotes her mum as much as I quote Penny. They're both being paranoid. Micah's a solid bloke. He'll marry Penelope, and then he'll want to take her home with him. That's what we should all be worried about. Anyway, magic. I miss magic when I'm away. When I'm by myself, magic is something personal. My burden, my secret. But at Watford, magic is just the air that we breathe. It's what makes me a part of something bigger. Not the thing that sets me apart. Number eight. Ebb and the Goats. I started helping out Ebb the Goatherd during my second year at Watford, and for a while, hanging out with goats was pretty much my favourite thing, which Baz had a field day with. Ebb's the nicest person at Watford, younger than the teachers, and surprisingly powerful for somebody who decided to spend her life taking care of goats. What does power have to do with anything, Ebb will say, People who are tall aren't forced to pay thrash can ball. You mean basketball? Living at Watford means Ebb's a bit out of touch. Same difference. I'm no soldier. Don't see why I have to fight for a living just because I can throw a punch. The mage says we're all soldiers. Every one of us with an ounce of magic. That's what's dangerous about the old ways, he says. Magicians just went about their merry way, doing whatever they felt like doing, treating magic like a toy or an entitlement, not something they had to protect. Ebb doesn't use a dog with the goats, just her staff. I've seen her turn the whole herd with a wave of her hand. She'd started teaching me how to pull the goats back one by one, how to make them all feel at once like they'd gone too far. She even let me help with the birthing one spring. I don't have much time to spend with Ebb anymore. 
but I leave her and the goats on my list of things to miss, just so that I can stop for a minute to think about them. Number nine, the wavering wood. I should take this one off the list. Fuck the wavering wood. Number ten, Agatha. Maybe I should take Agatha off my list too. I'm getting close to Watford now. I'll be at the station in a few minutes. Someone will have to come down from the school to fetch me. I used to save Agatha for last. I'd go all summer without thinking about her. Then, wait until I was almost to Watford before I'd let her back into my head. That way I wouldn't spend the whole summer convincing myself that she was too good to be true. But now? I don't know. Maybe Agatha is too good to be true, at least for me. Last term, just before Penny and I got snatched by the humdrum, I saw Agatha with Baz in the Wavering Wood. I suppose I'd sensed before that there might be something between them. But I never believed she'd betray me like that, that she'd cross that line. There was no time to talk to Agatha after I saw her with Baz. I was too busy getting kidnapped, then escaping, and then I couldn't talk to her over the summer because I can't talk to anybody. And now, I don't know. I don't know what Agatha is to me. I'm not even sure whether I've missed her.